Good morning, good afternoon, maybe even good evening. Matthew Grant here, and I'm dodging the autumn rains in the UK as Storm Babette has been dumping on us for the last few days and the country has come to a grinding halt. But we're also into the final week of the Rugby World Cup, and I've noticed that the World Cup and Instec both have one large thing in common, or maybe that's a few things, and that is the support of some of the world's largest company. Well, Cap Gemini is one of those companies, and I was delighted to have the chance to talk again to Chris Lesage de Fontenay and to hear how the company is investing $2 billion in generative AI and what Chris and his colleagues are seeing from their experience of working with insurers. Now, if you're interested in generative AI, then we also have a regular newsletter that covers specifically what insurers are doing in that area. And you can find that along with information about our reports, interviews, forthcoming events, and the companies we are working with on our website, www.instec.co. Chris, great to have you back on the podcast. This time it's even better because we're doing it face to face. Last time you were on, you've got your 1000 fans award, which means you had over 1000 listeners. In fact, you had 1200, which is brilliant. So we've got to beat that today. A little bit of background to Cap Gemini. You're a, one of the largest professional services organizations worldwide. You've got about 360,000 people around the world working across a whole range of industries, including, of course, insurance. Your role is as insurance practice leader. And I know one of the areas that you've been particularly interested in focusing on is this whole topic of, uh, of generative AI. Absolutely. Thank you for having me. Well, I see on your LinkedIn profile, you've got a great description, which is actually gives you my first question. So you describe yourself as solving the client pain points with the power of digital. So what are the kind of pain points your clients are bringing to you these days? Problems we are dealing with for our clients nowadays are not that dissimilar what they have been over the past five years, except they come faster and thicker now. And with the changes in the economic environment, we can see our clients are looking to solve their legacy and uh, the speed and resilience in a slightly different way. And instead of having a one big bang solution, they go for a, a multiple of, of 20% or you could say of a program. So they know they got an outcome from that and then they can adjust and change tact depending on the evolution of the market. So the issues continue to be, you know, speed to market. How do we get control and access and use our data? How do we move out of our legacy stack? And can we get on the latest and best tools that give us kind of that competitive advantage in the market? And that more incremental approach to, to change, is that leading to more success? Because there's some fairly credible statistics about the number of projects that fail, I believe over 80% in technology. But that a more incremental approach seems like it should de-risk the project. It definitely, yeah, it, it does de-risk the, the project. And I think the proposition and the solutions people like Capgemini and, and others can offer nowadays lends itself much more to be able to be incremental than before. Whereas before you were trying to resolve with one single large system to to run as your ERP. Now you you can do that in multiple phases with multiple different solutions. It definitely does de-risk. And I think it, it's an evolution that we're going to see continue. And what else? You've got pain points in here. So I'm sure there's more than one, one problem your clients are bringing to you. One other one, which is, is the access to talent, training and capability and being able to stand up uh, the right level of expertise, knowing how you are working with your incremental change. Because again, when you're doing that, you need to arm yourself with a different caliber, you could say, of talent in order to be able to adjust your programs and uh, implementations as they evolve. And I suspect that's going to get even harder because generative AI is, is the topic on everyone's lips just now. I know Cap Gemini, you're looking at recruiting something around 30,000 people, I believe, and multiple billions of spend on generative AI. Yeah. What kind of people are you going to be bringing into the organization? There's a close correlation between generative AI and data. You need to have the data in order to take advantage of the generative AI. We've committed to a 2 billion euro investment in generative AI people and training over the next three years. We'll be recruiting 30,000 new people predominantly in the data and then specifically with generative AI backgrounds that we can hone into our deliveries. But also we are investing significantly in future-proofing our current workforce in uh, generative AI technologies. How do you make sure that what you're learning or what the tools are learning is actually fact as opposed to hallucination? 
you need to build the guardrails before you start. You need to know effectively the box that you've got your Gen AI in before you let it loose. Like you say, they are keen to please. We find in the pilots we're running that this human loop is critical. And the insurance side of things, underwriting, huge level of, of research needed and uh, investigations when you're providing a quote. There's an acceleration here, but you can't replace the experience and the oversight of the human. And that human, you can move faster, but you still need to have that loop of, of overlooking and looking into the work that Gen AI did. So it doesn't really pr replace it, but in, instead of spending four hours making a quote, you can do it probably in two and a half. And, and then from the insurers themselves who are looking into this, those who are advising, there's a quite a big spectrum out there about you know, where these companies stand. But if we think for a minute about that, we you would call them the technology adoption curve, the early adopters, what are the, the, those companies that are at the forefront of using generative AI doing the you know, insurance companies today? So what they're doing is they're building capability faster than anyone else. So they are investing in the future. This is... Uh, training and uh, mobilizing their, their staff and internal organization. They've usually have set up uh, multi-purpose teams working on the user stories or prospects for the Gen AI. They will be more aggressive in terms of building those sandboxes uh, for the generative AI pilots. And what we're seeing in the market is that a lot of piloting is happening now, not of learning. And that's going to continue, I think, into all of next year. I think that the real explosion in terms of deployment of products and uh, solutions out, out of Gen AI is going to start coming in in 2025, when those who are now investing are going to be launching different propositions, both in terms of go-to-market as, as well as internal productivity. And running those pilots, that, that's part of what you do at Capgemini, is that right? Yeah, yeah. We have a ready-made pilot environment with guardrails, sandboxes. We work with the top 15 uh, providers of insurance in the UK and, and US on that. So we have 160 use cases kind of under investigations, about 30 pilots on the go, uh, of which seven or eight have kind of gone quite far. Still at a pilot stage, but our position of being where we're at in the market of being a, a, an SI with a, a capability in the Gen AI space allows us to have a communal learning, you could say, across the market. So we can see the different use cases, where the market is heading and what people are most interested in. It's not just people looking at ways to generate code uh, cheaper and faster or to do the testing cheaper and faster. It ranges from HR to career development of your employees to evolution of your products. Which part of the business would you use as an example where people are starting to run pilots? And, and also I'm interested, if an insurance company is doing a pilot, who in that organization is actually running or working on the pilot with you? We've seen those pilots kind of coming more into more tactical and more, you could say, short-term useful while they're learning. For example, organizations are looking at what claims are should be payable and should not be contested versus the ones that should be contested. So particularly when you're talking about large claims, legal costs in tens or hundreds of millions, claims uh, number in billions, in being able to be better predict your likelihood of win or a loss in those can help you decide where you invest your, your legal effort going forward and where you settle early and possibly at, at a lower cost. So that's an example of one where, you, where it's very high return, but it's a high risk as well. So in order to then deploy that fully in, into the environment, you need to be very certain that your AI, your gen AI is doing the right thing. And I think it's an example of a healthcare company in the U US that through the AI, it was not a gen AI, but the AI rejected 300,000 claims. And that's now been taken to court. It's going to be probably in the courts for quite a while. But basically, in that case, the AI deemed the claims not to be payable. Yeah, it's that classic problem of the false positives. So you, on the one hand, you want to make sure you're not missing fraud that should be rejected. But on the other hand, it sounds like in this example, you've got to be very careful not to reject genuine claims. And I guess that's partly why you say you still need the human in the loop to, yeah. to monitor it. But, but it is interesting how yeah, different insurance companies have got different appetites. 
if I give you another example, which is kind of probably closer to home, we work with um, uh, Insura where they are using the generative AI to improve the code. So writing code, they are improving the quality of the code significantly and um, productivity is growing significantly as well. I mean, mind bogglingly so. These are kind of areas where you can see very short term productivity gains. But again, how do you scale them up? Every client is different, every environment. So depending on how mature your your coders are, how mature your business is in terms of its requirements, how much benefit you see and how well you can deploy it. It's still kind of a part of a learning curve, but we've been running. It's a, it's a significant uh, opportunity there if it's handled in the right way. And talking about that coding and coming back to your point earlier about training people, I've been looking at what's possible with Python code and generative AI. There's, a, I guess, a level where as you bring people into the organization or you train your own people, that actually learning to code is very helpful because it gives people an ability to actually scale that quite significantly. So are you seeing that? And I think I suspect it also may link into your recruitment, but is that part of your training is actually training people to do things that are not necessarily directly around generative AI, but they're actually enablers for using generative AI tools? Absolutely, because it's not just about training in a generative AI tool. You need uh, other foundations to taking advantage of it. And what we're seeing now, you asked earlier about what kind of... Uh, teams that the, our clients were deploying. The most productive ones, where you're getting the most, you could say, imaginative and practical and you could quality of test cases is where you have a multi-functional AI team that is giving the uh, mechanism, whether it's a sandbox and the support to actually test. And where we see those teams coming together, they come up with solutions that you think that's going to work once they get this right versus where we've also seen where you've got quite narrow selection of skill sets in the teams and they obviously pick the problems they face every day and are more narrow and, and go deeper. As part of that overall training then, there's, there's, we talked a bit talked about this the technology training, but as you talk there, you're getting starting to get into creativity, sometimes called design thinking, there's a whole element there, you know, some of the more advanced companies we know are very thoughtful about how they build their products. So you also, when you're training, training people on how to create new ideas and new products, as well as just purely te the technical aspects. Absolutely. Absolutely. And that, that's a part of it. And we are fortunate of, of being the scale we're at, where we have large teams working solely on innovation, new products. And, you know, I spoke there about the clients having multifunctional teams. This is kind of what we do for a living, is bringing uh, multifunctions into different challenging areas and therefore kind of giving our clients and ourselves a far better chance of succeeding and delivering an excellent outcome. What's the experience starting to be like from the people that are the receiving end who are now being or being asked to use these tools to, to engage with their insurer? We did a survey on our, on our consumers in um, multiple geographies. And the level of trust that consumers have surprised us in generative AI. So if they knew the uh, response out of the search or recommendation was a generative AI solution, that 70% plus believed that was a trustworthy uh, recommendation. And that is a number that is much greater than if you go on a government website and ask people, do you believe in the statistics that are coming out of the government? So it's quite a high levels of trust in the generative AI process without really understanding how it comes together and what the risks of that recommendation or, or suggestions might be. And do you think that might have something to do with the nature of the language? Because the, the response you get back from these tools, ChatGPT, it's very human-like. And so is that is that trust because people just, they're engaging in what seems like a educated human and, and someone who's not kind of on the Friday afternoon and fed up. And there's, there's a sort of inherent engagement with the technology that creates more trust. Yeah, it's definitely a large part of it. It's also the media coverage of generative AI. It is the answer to everything and the risk of everything. It's, it's kind of considered to be the upgrade from Google. And because it can deliver you the, the responses kind of in your language, customized to you, it does feel genuine. And I'm wondering, Chris, if what, something that's going on here is that if we look now at Google or Amazon, they're both quite similar. If you put a, a query in there, they will come back with what is being driven by where they can sell advertising. Whereas we're still in the early days of generative AI tools. And so 
it's very important to get the engagement. So they're somewhat more pure in terms of the answer you give. Do you, so do you think an element of why people trust them is because all the things we talked about, but also there's just an element of you get the answer and you believe that that is the best that the tool can do, as opposed to it's trying to go and direct you towards something because it's going to generate money from the answer it gives you. That's definitely a factor there. And therein lies, you could say, the risk. The, the advertising and the promotion could be far better hidden in the generative AI. If, if an organization understands how to position themselves with the information that is then used by the generative AI, you could actually be getting your free advertising, free recommendations for very little investment. And it's never actually seen as, as a promotion because there's no guardrails of saying, how did you come to that conclusion, you know, generative AI, when you ask the question. But if same thing, because it's your language, it feels more genuine. So there's a risk in that as well. You're right, it's less, less mature and therefore it's not seen as, as commercial. One very important point we're seeing in the insurance industry is that we have more experience and talent leaving the industry out of retirement and even moving to other parts of, of the economy than we are replenishing. And statistics show about 400,000 insurance professionals will be retiring in the US market. So 400,000 over the next seven years. There is looking at the pipeline of talent coming in and the growth of experience is very difficult to keep up with that. How do you replace that talent pool? Uh, generative AI has to be one of the answers uh, to that. Not the sole answer, but, but one of the answers of how you can evolve the, the new breed of actuaries who, who use generative AI in a different way and makes them therefore more productive and, and able to perhaps do the work with, with less effort. And you mentioned the US in there, and it just occurs to me, is there a difference by, by geography in terms of how people are adopting generative AI, either on insurance or just more broadly different due to the, the sort of the cultures of the, of the organizations and their own desire to try out new technology? There is a difference, yes, but I would still say the largest difference is dependent on scale. We look at our largest um, insurers, they can afford to invest in in Gen AI in, in the tens of millions without a need for return you know, this year, because they can see the benefit case is strong if you look five years ahead. Whereas the smaller medium size, they have to be a lot more selective and probably won't have the option of doing that. They'll have to wait for the solution to evolve in the marketplace and, and buy it from there. So in, in terms of adoption between geographies, US is leading, in my opinion, but this this is kind of a, a, a general uptake and probably they're leading more so because of the, the scale of the organizations they, they work with. And you mentioned cost in there, and I suppose most people's experience as a consumer, you can download free version of ChatGPT or Bard, but of course it does get expensive if you're doing this commercially, but, but what is... What is driving those costs for those insurance organizations? It is the same as you're moving from legacy data center to a cloud. If you're constantly running analysis on that cloud, it'll cost you more than the data center, for example. If you then decide to run a generative AI, which takes a lot of energy to do, it'll cost you even more. So we see in the organizations who are advanced with the pilots, they, they understand that you, you can't just kind of put a blanket on top of everything you do. You need to be selective about where it gives you the, the greatest benefits, whether that is in developing kind of your relationship with your, your customers or your HR or with your coding, and then, then work those benefit cases. But you're right, the cost of running uh, generative AI on, on a large a number of a large data set is high. Chris, you've covered an awful lot there. For anybody now who wants to learn a little bit more about what next, particularly if they're working at an insurance company and want to consider bringing Capgemini in to help them, what's the best way to uh, learn more about what you're doing and find the people to talk to? Before I answer that question, so you're saying what we are, well, simplest thing is to get in touch with me, Christopher Lasage de Fontenay. You find me on LinkedIn and uh, get in touch and, and I can get you connected with the right people. Excellent. Well, Chris, there aren't many people with your name on LinkedIn about <laughs> no. your unique, so there shouldn't be any problem <laughs> finding you and we'll put a link in the episode notes. Uh, Chris, it's been a real pleasure and thank you very much for coming to see us face to face in our offices. It's well. been a pleasure to do this, uh, yeah, not, not digitally, despite the fact we're talking about digital. Likewise, thank you for having me.
That's it for today. Well, let us know if you're interested in learning more about how we can help you become more successful through our collaboration of the Incurus. That's the Instec community and our network around the world, bringing together insurers, technology companies, and a whole lot more. Hello at instec.co, or you can find me, Matthew Grant, on LinkedIn. That's it. We're done. a bit that's not going to be the end of it what are you going to work on next you give a bit of early warning to your fedata colleagues as to how you see the company evolving going forward and your goals for the company we have of course a growth strategy and that is uh, not just because of own ambitious but the market is very unmature still it's probably 10 percent or something of the market that have done these digital transformations And so the market potential is very big. We want to be seen as the natural choice for those who want to have a digital transformation and become more or uh, fully AI-driven. This is the position we would like to take in the market. And we are, of course, dreaming that uh, we will be a very big company with very big revenue. We might even dream of becoming an IPO in the next years to come so we can take in new capital to actually grow in other markets and so on. So this is, of course, growth we are aiming for. But equally important is really to make clients successful. And that is always our goal number one. And that is also my personal goals. So our aim is, of course, to transform the insurance industry to help the insurer to make a controlled and minimized risk journey of of their transformation of a very, very complex organization and complex tech setup. Because many of them have been in business for many years. So the complexity in the legacy setup is huge. They spend maybe 90% of their time on operation just to keep the light on the legacy. So what we dream of is really to make a difference for those and free up time for them uh, so they can focus on building up uh, the new world. So this is our dreams, and uh, you can say financially, that is, of course, becoming very big for us. So we are really dreaming on being one of the dominant players worldwide, but the dominant player in Europe. That's a very good way to end. That's very inspiring stuff. You set the bar high, and I think that's an admirable position to take. Look, it's been a pleasure chatting away to you. Congratulations on everything that you've done. I know that you won't rest on your laurels. There's plenty more to do. And I do hope you'll come back in a few years' time and we can talk again about how the next part of the journey went. Thanks for joining me. Thank you so much. Thank you for joining us at Instec. We are working with insurers and technology companies around the world to help them find business partners and to learn more about what is driving successful use of data and analytics today. If you're interested in membership, please contact us at hello at instec.co or for more information about membership, our reports and future events, please go to www.instec.co. That's it. We're done.